We are recording. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Partha Roop and welcome to this uh, tutorial um, in ES Week education classes on a synchronous approach for the design of biomedical cyber-physical systems. Um, with me, um, I have uh, Dr. Nathan Allen from the University of Auckland and Dr. Hammond Pierce from NYU. Um, and we will do this presentation in sequence, starting with me. So in the first part, I will introduce the problem, uh, including uh, a motivating example of the cardiac conduction system. And then I will present um, an approach for modeling such cyber physical systems using the well known synchronous approach. I will present a tool chain called SC charts. And, um, and using that, I will motivate several examples. Following me, uh, my colleague, Dr. Nathan Allen, will present um, the example of a pacemaker and how to validate the pacemaker using the cardiac model. And he will also talk about formal verification of the pacemaker. Following that, we will discuss security issues in biomedical CPS and um, Hammond Pierce, Dr. Pierce will lead that. Finally, we'll conclude. So when we talk about cyber physical systems, it's essentially distributed embedded controllers, which use many diverse networks to control physical processes. Examples range from, say, automotive applications, say, drive-by-wire applications where multiple engine control units control um, the speed of the car, the position um, and uh, acceleration of the vehicle, or in the medical devices setting in, in the context of cyber-physical systems, uh, we have this motivating example where when a human heart is diseased due to any kind of arrhythmia, you can have a medical device such as a pacemaker to control the rhythm of the heart such that it is beating um, within the normal um, rhythm of a normal heart, which is um, 80 to 120 beats per minute. Now, when we talk about such medical CPS, obviously, such devices are highly safety critical. They are usually certified by FDA. But turns out that many pacemakers had firmware related issues and other kinds of safety related issues. For example, between 1990 and 2000, 41% and roughly 200,000 of recalled pacemakers and implantable uh, ICD devices in USA had firmware issues. And uh, more recently, uh, this is a publication from 2013, which talks about huge number of recalls between 2006 to 2011. And on this figure, you can see number of adverse events, and these are in thousands. And you can see uh, those which are even leading to injury, malfunction, and death, and the numbers are staggering. So how do we design such systems such that we can ensure that they operate safely at all times? So in order to motivate this, what we will do is we will present this heart and pacemaker combination as a kind of emulation platform. I will initially share a video and then um, this uh, video will be further elaborated. I will just share my screen again. Hopefully you can see my screen and on the screen is the device, which is a um, Altera 
device um, on which uh, we we have uh, the cardiac model which is um, which is going to um, execute and this is hardware software code design of this cardiac model where parts of it execute on an arm processor and parts of it execute um, on the FPGA device and this is a Medtronic pacemaker which is connected to this heart emulation system and later on Nathan will demonstrate this video in more detail. So if we continue So essentially, then instead of uh, uh, kind of testing the pacemaker using live organs, we can test using the model of a heart. And for this kind of pacemaker, which is a dual channel pacemaker where two leads are going into the heart, one into the right atrium, and that is abstracted as a Boolean signal called atrium sense, one into the right ventricle, which can be abstracted in as a Boolean signal called ventricular sense. So the two leads of the pacemaker that, uh, that, the, um, that are implanted into the heart that the pacemaker is sensing. And then when correct timing is not enforced, the pacemaker will pace either the atrium or the ventricle. Now this um, is actually a hard real-time system as is evident from the following timing diagram. So we, we have on one hand, the cardiac model of the heart. And the, on the other hand, we have the pacemaker. The cardiac model of the heart can be abstracted into a cardiac conduction system, which consists of what we call as nodes and paths. Um, and each node essentially stimulate either autoarrhythmically like the SA node or a node stimulate because of the voltage of adjoining nodes. And the paths essentially act as delays, timing delays between the nodes to indicate uh, the propagation of this voltage. So when we talk about um, the, a, a given cardiac node, a cardiac node uh, is either um, the, the, the action potential um, which is depicted um, on the y-axis and x-axis is time. Essentially, the no uh, a node can be in one of four phases. Phase zero, which is resting. Phase one, which is stimulated, which is um, until this threshold voltage Vt. And when the voltage uh, of a cell exceeds this threshold voltage because of the voltage of neighboring cells, it goes into phase two, which is upstroke, where it goes into a maximum voltage, VO, after which there is a steady decay. And this phase, phase three is known as ERP, effective refract refractory. And during this phase, what the cell does is it blocks any external stimulation. So even if there is external stimulation, the uh, cell will not um, have um, will not get stimulated. How, however, during the relative refractory phase, if there is external stimulation, there will be secondary excitation. This can be modeled formally. The action potential of a node can be modeled formally using the notion of a hybrid automata. For example, the four phases we talked about resting is modeled by Q0. Q1 likewise models stimulated, which is from Vt to V0, and so on and so forth. So if we look at, say, Q0, the initial location, here we have got ODs which express the rate of change of um, kind of the voltage of a cell modeled using three different variables, Vx, Vy, and Vz, which are expressed using these ODs. And we have an algebraic equation which creates the overall voltage. G of V indicates the aggregated voltage from the neighboring cells. And when the aggregated voltage of the neighboring cells is less than or equal to Vt, the cell 
will not get stimulated and control will reside in this location Q naught. When on the other hand, the aggregated voltage exceeds this threshold voltage, we will move to this transition will be taken and um, control will resume from a new location after initializing the value of the variables uh, and, and different ODs will take effect. So in this manner, we can mathematically model the action potential of an individual cell. And when we compose them, then we can uh, formally, we can essentially model a complete heart, which will be presented later. Now, I was also talking about the pacemaker, which is the controller that controls the rhythmic beating of the heart in the event that the patient suffers from a cardiac condition known as bradycardia. Bradycardia means that the heart is beating less than 50 beats per minute. In such an event, um, essentially the pacemaker kicks in. So essentially what the pacemaker is maintaining is several timers like AVI, URI, AEI, LRI, etc. And these timers will be elaborated further in latter part of this presentation when we design the pacemaker. But I will talk about a few of the timers to explain how this is a hard real-time system. For example, AVI is a deadline between any atrial event and the corresponding ventricular event. So once we sense the atrial event, if a normal or intrinsic ventricular event is sensed before AVI, then that timer is reset. And that's why this region is shaded. However, in this case, in time point two, we again start the AVI timer because we have an atrial sense. However, the, before the timer has expired, we haven't had um, any, um, ventricular event, so the pacemaker will pace the heart using the V-pace event. Um, so this is an example of a deadline. I will talk about another timer, which is known as URI, which is a delay. URI is the minimum time separation between two ventricular events. So we have one V-sense here. We start two timers, LRI and URI. LRI is, indicates low rate in the interval which is the maximum time separation between two ventricular events. And URI indicates the upper rate interval, which is the minimum time separation. So um, after a ventricular sense, the next ventricular sense can, or ventricular pace can only happen after URI. For example, here we have um, a ventricular pace at which we have started URI and LRI. And what has happened is that AVI has actually expired. Now, VPS should have happened at this point, but because URI hasn't happened, we have to extend AVI. In this case, URI takes priority over AVI. So in this timing diagram, we not only have different kinds of timers, but we have, we have deadlines, delay, as well as priority as indicated here, where because URI hasn't expired, AVI time is extended and VPS happens only after the URI has expired. So this is a very good example of a cyber physical safety critical system. Now, when we want to model such a system, we need to think about modeling several key facets of such systems. And one of the very well-known approach for modeling such safety critical systems is the synchronous approach, which is, uh, made famous in the mid eighties by three well-known languages um, known as Esteril, Sinial, and Luster. And now uh, this is kind of the default standard, for example, in the aviation space where Airbus A380, for example, um, uses the SCADE compiler for um, uh, generating certified code. So when we design such medical cyber physical systems, if we use the conventional approach, then what are the key things we need to consider and what are the pitfalls? So as we saw in this example of the cardiac conduction system, 
the conduction system itself consists of many nodes which are executing concurrently. Also, the pacemaker and the heart are operating in parallel. So concurrency and parallelism are things that we have to contend with. In addition, such systems are known as reactive systems. The reactive meaning that uh, the, the pacemaker continuously interacts with its environment, which is the heart, and operates at a rate which is determined by the environment, whatever constraints that the environment determines. And also, we have strict timing deadlines. And violating any deadlines may lead to very bad consequences for the patient. As a result, such systems are also known as real-time systems. Now, if we use the conventional approach to such concurrency, then the traditional approach is to use real-time operating systems. And in real-time operating systems, we have the tasking model. For example, very simply speaking, if we have two asynchronous tasks, one which triggers through an external event called first, the second which triggers through an external event called second, then we will, if we execute this, then we will have such interleavings. For example, first could happen before second or second could happen before first. As a result, there is some kind of interleaved non-determinism. Further, if we look at the real-time operating systems and uh, the model of processes or threads. If we look at this simple example where we have a shared global va variable in the shared memory model, and we have two processes. Each process essentially um, loads this shared variable into a temporary variable and has an iteration where it increments the temporary variable and updates the global variable based on the shared variable. And both processes code are identical. Now, it turns out that even for such simple tasking model or threading model, uh, the model is not going to produce determinate code in the sense that the value of the shared variable will not be a fixed value. Instead, it will be between two integers, m and n. And uh, it can be any value in that interval. Let's see why that can happen. So uh, for this example, um, the two extreme possibilities will lead to kind of the value of either 20 or 35. Let's look at this value 35. That's simple to understand. If we execute either P1 completely and then the scheduler context switches to P2, then essentially starting with this initial value of five, this will make the value five plus 15, 20, and then the other one will increment by 15 more, which will make it the value 35. So that's easy to see. The other extreme is when interleaving happens after every thread during any iteration executes and initializes stem from the global shared variable but shared is not yet updated. So then a context switch happens to the next thread. Again, the same shared value is read and then its stem value is updated. And then shared is essentially written by both threads with identical value. So in that case, the value will be 20. So as we saw in this example, and uh, this is a kind of problem with threads and this is a very good citation. Uh, which is um, a, a kind of a landmarking paper by Edward Lee, where he talks about the kind of problems of interleaved concurrency. And one of the things he talks about, uh, one potential solution, and he talks about a range of them, is using the synchronous approach. So we will now talk about this synchronous approach. What exactly is the synchronous approach? Are there any participants and are there any questions? So if anyone want to uh, ask a question, you can stop me at any time by raising your hand or putting your questions in the chat. If there are any questions, 
please put it in chat or please raise your hand. So just as a quick recap, what I have presented so far is the cardiac conduction model consisting of multiple uh, models of cardiac cells modeled as hybrid automata, which are all operating concurrently. And also models of paths, which are modeled as timed automata and all they, these all path and um, node models or cell models are composed concurrently. Now, how do we compose them concurrently is the question. So one very interesting approach is the synchronous approach. And there is a very nice survey paper synchronous languages 12 years later, which summarizes these kind of synchronous programming models. And one of the key facets of this model is what is known as the synchrony hypothesis. So the synchrony hypothesis is the fundamental basis and we'll, we'll delve into this in some detail. And this states that the idealized reactive system, in this case, this is the pacemaker, this operates infinitely fast relative to the heart. So this operates much, much, much faster than the heart, but it operates so fast as if there is zero delay between an input and the corresponding output. Now you might ask, how can you have zero delay in any system? We'll talk about that subsequently. And if you have any questions, I will elaborate that further. In addition to the synchrony hypothesis, there is also the synchronous threading, where all concurrent threads execute in lockstep relative to peaks of a global logical clock. So this clock is logical, and we'll see a simulation in a C charts where all threads trigger relative to the ticks of this clock, similar to synchronous circuits. Any output generated is broadcasted to all concurrent modules. But the most important aspect is automaticity and instantaneity of reactions. So essentially what synchronous compilers do, unlike the threading model in real-time operating systems, where there is a dynamic scheduler, normally in a synchronous program, scheduling is done at compile time. And this compile time scheduled code is converted into a single monolithic reaction function which is considered atomic. What is the meaning of atomic? Atomicity essentially implies that interrupts cannot happen within the duration of a reaction due to the synchrony hypothesis we talked about. Now, also because of synchrony, we have reaction to absence. Not only can a thread or, or, or the reactive system react to the presence of an event, it can also react to the absence or uh, falsity of an event. We will, we will look at this uh, in this SC charts framework. Now, what exactly is SC charts? SC chart is a state chart, similar to Harrell's state chart, which is very well known and uh, has been proposed long time ago. What exactly is a state chart? A state chart is essentially milli machines combined with hierarchy or depth, orthogonality or concurrency, broadcast communication, and data handling. However, there are fundamental differences between Harrell state charts and SC charts, which is a synchronous state chart or a synchronous process algebra. Now, SC chart, like Harrell state chart, has many similarities. Uh, like, for example, um, the concept of milli machines or more machines and their compositions, transitions, signals, or events, hierarchy, modularity, and parallelism is similar. But the main difference is that the approach uses the synchronous framework and is deterministic by construction, unlike um, Harold's state chart, which has many, many different interpretations and semantics. And one of the key facets of Harrell's state chart is a very expressive feature, which is like go-tos in normal programming languages like C, which allows inter-level transitions, which we disallow in synchronous programming. Now, since 
Um, we are talking about milling machines. Let's first start with um, a kind of a formalization of milling machines. So a milling machines is nothing but a tuple. A milling machine M is a um, quintuple consisting of a set of states, an initial state, some inputs, some outputs, and transitions. And each transition is from a source state to a destination state. And the transition is taken when some Boolean condition over inputs is satisfied. And then it generates a subset of outputs. That's why the power set here in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this product. And then you go to the destination state. We'll see an example. So here is a simple example of a milli machine, a synchronous milli machine. And because it is synchronous, we can react to both the presence and the absence. This milli machine consists of two states, zero and one. State zero being the initial state. So the Q, the state space is zero, one. The set, set of inputs is A and B, and the set of outputs is C and D. Here is an example transition from zero to zero. So from source zero to destination zero, when the input A is absent, that means A is false or A is not present in the environment. And this transition is taken when A is false, no outputs are generated and we go back to zero. Let's look at another transition from zero to one. So we could take a transition from zero to one when A is true and B is false. So we can have a Boolean condition like this, A and not B, and we produce an output C and we go to the destination state one in this instance. And we can generate multiple outputs like in the transition from one to zero, which is taken when B is true and A is false and C and D are emitted. Now this milli machine has some undesirable features. So to understand these undesirable features, we'll uh, define two key requirements of synchronous programs. The first requirement, which I will not define mathematically, but somewhat informally, is known as determinism. And then we saw that the previous threading model was non-deterministic. Now, what exactly is determinism from the point of view of a synchronous model? A Boolean milli machine is deterministic if and only if, given any valid combination of inputs from the environment, at most one transition is enabled from any state where control is residing currently. So whenever control is residing, so let's look at transitions taken out of one. So if you provide input B, then you'll notice that transition can be taken from one to one. Also B and not A could also be taken. So this is an example of non-determinism. Now, the second requirement is reactivity. Reactivity is somewhat similar to deadlock freedom. Reactivity says that from any state, at least one transition is enabled whenever a valid input combination is um, provided from the environment. Now that is also not satisfied. For example, state zero is non-reactive. So if you provide, for example, the input B, we will deadlock in this state because neither this transition or this transition is taken. So this is an example of a, um, of a milli machine, which is non-reactive and non-deterministic. And we don't want this to happen for a synchronous program. So now we'll motivate a typical example uh, by modifying a specification of a very well-known um, program, which is like the hello world of synchronous programming, which I have modified. And the original specification is known as ABRO. So ABRO says, whenever two inputs A, B has happened, and if the reset input R hasn't happened in the environment, emit the output O. I have slightly modified this. So instead of reacting to the presence of B, in my specification, we'll react to the absence of B. So when A is present and B is absent and R is absent, we emit O. However, we have also made O um, a kind of a, um, a value that we will emit. So along with O, we'll emit a value. 
So generate an output O, o when A is present and B is absent. Reset this behavior when R has happened. So R is a reset. Further, when A happens, increment count variable, which is initialized to zero. So we want to increment count. Likewise, when B happens, first increment count and then increment it again by two sequentially. The value of O should be the value of count. So emit the value of O, which is the value of count. Now, this specification uh, can be done in SC chart in the following manner. Now, as I said, SC chart is a kind of a um, synchronous concurrent programming language where we have got two concurrent threads, one which is waiting on A and another which is waiting on absence of B or not B. And when A happens, now both threads are sharing this global count variable. One thread is incrementing count, the second thread is incrementing, followed by um, an um, increment of count by two sequentially. So each transition, so delays happen in a state and transitions are instantaneous. Now, in a traditional sense, such program in, in, in any threading model will be kind of non-deterministic. However, we'll see that a C chart will generate sequential code from this, which will provide deterministic behavior to this program. So now I will show you the SC charts tool briefly and we'll go through a few examples and then I will hand over to my colleague, Nathan Aller. So we'll now look at the SC charts programming environment. I'll again share my screen, give me a minute. Any questions in the interim? Okay. Are there any questions? And just to, for people on Zoom, you can always put your questions directly into the Zoom chat and we can see them that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you, Adam. So actually, this is not a question, but I'd like to ask for your comment about, I mean, this general thing. So, um, okay, so I, I, I do understand with all these things we are fighting against uncertainty but if you look at this current trend people actually take advantage of uncertainty and if you take a you know neural network for example maybe we don't know what is happening inside but the result is really good so people rely on it so people rather than you know fighting against this undeterminism or uncertainty they are nowadays taking advantage of it so is this becoming more true in this domain as well? Uh, I, I, I'm just out of curiosity. I just like to ask for your comment about this, you know, thing. Yeah, th this is indeed a very, very nice question. Uh, um, so thanks for asking Dr. Yan. Um, so indeed, um, you can have, you can exploit. So there are two kinds of um, cyber physical systems. One kind that we are presenting are mostly control dominated. And the synchronous approach is a very good fit for such control dominated systems. The other kind is, I talked about the autonomous vehicle example. And in that setting, that is very data dominated because you have information coming from sensors, LIDARs, cameras, and you want to use AI machine learning for such approaches. And uh, basically, when we design such systems, we need to look at the uncertainty in the environment, in the data-dominated aspects of such systems and take advantage of those, as well as the control-dominated aspects, uh, like the ABS braking and all those kinds of. And these are actually interacting. So your question is very pertinent. Thanks for asking the question. Now, actually, we have done some work where we show how the synchronous model could be used for also modeling both control dominated and data dominated systems. And we can still preserve the determinism and we propose the concept of synchronous neural networks. And um, we have also generated compilers from Keras to 
um, C and VHDL. Um, and we call these neural networks as hardware neural networks. The initial models are in Keras, but one aspect that I would like to say, we, we do not do any online learning. All the learning is done offline in Keras. Then we again generate deterministic code. So our code is still deterministic. So we use neural networks, but we generate deterministic code. So it is possible to marry the synchronous paradigm with data informed paradigms where neural networks and other kinds of um, approximate algorithms are used. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insight thank you. Thank answer. You. Thank you. And, and just, just to uh, add to it, there is a very good paper by Stavros Kripakis, and I'll put it into chat later on when mm -hmm. my colleagues are speaking, which talks about the challenges of the design of combined control and data driven cyber physical system. So I'll put that paper in chat. Thanks. Yeah, it would be great. It would be great. Thank you. So okay. here is this SC chart programming environment, uh, and it's developed. Uh, and this is no, a tool not developed in Auckland, but developed by Kiel University in Germany. And this tool is called Keeler. And uh, Keeler is publicly available, it's a public domain tool. It's based on Eclipse, but there is also a Visual Studio plugin as well. So you can also download it on Visual Studio. Now, the beauty of Keeler is that you have some textual language. So I have described this graph as a text on the left hand pane and on the right is the graph for example if i modify this so so let me explain this graph a little bit so i have two concurrent threads one waiting for a and the other waiting for the absence of b and when both threads complete their execution they reach their final states called da and db and when both threads complete their execution we take this transition, which then generates O. And this transition is known as a normal termination transition because behavior has terminated normally because both threads have completed their execution normally. On the other hand, we can have a preemption like an interrupt, which can happen due to a reset. And this is known as a strong reset. If R is true, then none of this behavior will execute, which I will simulate and show. Now, this can be either a strong reset, which I say if R abort to ABO, ABO is this hierarchical state within which this behavior is enclosed. So if this state exists, then all this behavior is preempted and restarted. So now instead of aborting, I can say just go to R and this will be a weak preemption. And if I save this diagram, then you will notice that the graph is changed. So it's very easy to generate these graphs. And because of lack of time, I'm not able to do a complete uh, demo of this, but uh, that is very good documentation. So if R then go to ABO, so I'm now doing a weaker version and weaker version means R is checked at the end of the peak. Whereas in, in, on the slides, we, we have got the stronger version. So with the weaker version, the body will get a chance to execute when R is taken. So that means output O is generated and then restarted. So we can take the weaker version or the stronger version. So since I've modified this graph, let's do the simulation of the weaker version. I hope people can see my screen. So what I will do is I can compile this and there are several types of compilers to C or Java. And these compilers will produce sequential code and um, what I'm doing now is I am uh, going to, so the code has been generated and now I'm simulating this. And as I'm simulating, you will notice that control is in the hierarchical state ABO, as well as weight AB, as well as WA and WB, all are highlighted in red. And then because of synchrony, we can tick or step through this execution. And when we step through, Initially, all my signals are false in the environment. I have not set anything. So if I step, nothing is happening. Now what I will do is I will set A to true and also B to true. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake. I, in, in the next step, actually the transition to B triggered 
because absence of B, because B was not true. So that transition is triggered. Now, if I set A to true, then the other transition triggers. Now, this is a normal termination because both final states are reached. Now, O is generated and O has a value of four. And in all scenarios, O will have a value of four because this thread will make the value of count to three. This thread will increment it further by one. So even if you schedule it in any order statically, even if you schedule this followed by that or that followed by this, you'll always get a deterministic value of four. In our paper, we'll give the argument about why this happens. And this is due to an argument or a, a, a requirement of synchronous compilers, which generate what is known as constructed code. That if a scheduling order exists, then the generated code is constructive. And when it is constructive, then it will be able to generate code. And the constructiveness assumption is what is known as sequentially constructive. That's why this prefix SC charts. SC is sequentially constructive, which is more general than the original constructiveness of Gerard Berry, which is called Berry constructive. So this is more general because such sequential updates are allowed, which is not allowed in earlier synchronous programming. And these sequential updates are very natural because People familiar with C, C++, uh, or any sequential programming languages are familiar with sequential updates. So sequential updates in any threads are allowed in SC charts. So this is the first example in, uh, in, in my case. And then I have another example. Now in this case, there is no communication between the threads. The threads are um, kind of operating synchronously, but they are updating the count variable kind of on their own, but because of scheduling order and determinism and constructiveness, we always have a deterministic value of four in whatever order I execute. Now we'll see a different example where there is communication and synchronization. And this is also a well-known example, which I have slightly modified. This is um, what is known as an up-down timer. Now in this up-down timer, I can either count up or count down. And um, I start execution in the not counting state. And then when I start, I can start both, uh, uh, both the counting operations um, kind of either synchronously or they can go in some interleaved manner. But again, this is deterministic. So I will show this again through a quick simulation because we don't have a lot of time. So I will start by stepping. And then what I will do is initially, I will say that I will provide the start signal. And when I provide the start signal, then control will go from not counting to counting. And simultaneously, first and second states will execute concurrently again because of synchrony. And then I'm in A0, B0, 0, 0, and 1, 1 in the two counters. One will uh, go from 0, 0 to 1, 1. The other one will go from 1, 1 to 0, 0. And the first one triggers based on the input first, and the second one triggers based on the input second. So let's see. Suppose I provide the input first, first, and then first again. Now, what you will notice here is synchrony in action, where this transition triggers, and then B is generated synchronously without any delay. That B is broadcasted because of which this transition also triggers synchronously. Right, so two transitions trigger synchronously. Now we see synchronous communication with instantaneous or zero delay. I will now provide second also to true and we can quickly step through this. So second is now true. And now we can either continue and one of them has reached its end. We can take this term in normal termination or we can terminate because of some preemption condition. Say R is true. So if R is true, then essentially I'll preempt this behavior and I will come back to not counting. So here I showed kind of synchronous broadcast communication and preemption. And also there is priority. There is a weaker preemption transition, which could trigger when R is false and start is false. There is a normal termination transition and R, but this is the highest priority, which is indicated by one. So when so we have got transition priorities and that are determined by the textual order in which we write code. So here 
are his highest priority, then the next highest and the next highest. So depending on the textual order, we have the order in which transitions trigger. Now, all these examples are untimed. Now, untimed uh, setting um, is, um, is still uh, possible that we can design synchronous system and derive timing by counting ticks, but that has some issues. I will show that to you using the final example that I will take you to. And after that, I will hand over to my colleague. So I have got a very simple final example, which I call as a reaction timer. And I've got two concurrent reaction timers, one modeled as a timed automata in SC charts. Now, many of my colleagues will, here will be familiar with timed automata. In a timed automata, we can use, instead of just discrete time, we can use continuous time using what are known as clock variables. So for example, T is a clock variable. That means there is an associated OD, which is T dot equal to one. That means it's a uniformly uh, increasing clock, which I start at this point whenever the start input happens. However, in the synchronous setting, without using real value clocks, I can still model time um, using this concept of multi-form time. So what exactly is multi-form time? So I want to model a reaction timer. What is a reaction timer? So a human user will see an LED, which will be shown to them when the, when the start input comes, and they have to press the done signal. And when the done signal comes, we are going to output how much time has elapsed. Now, if they press the done signal before 300 milliseconds, then we will go to the timeout state. That means that they exceeded the time limit. If on the other hand, done comes before that, then we will go back to idle. So that's the idea. Is someone able to react within the deadline or after the deadline? What we can do is we can take an input called hundreds of milliseconds, which is an actual input, and we can model this as a pure synchronous specification. Here, there are no clocks. So let's execute this. So I have given the start input. Oh, I made some mistakes. So let me compile this again. Okay, so now both the machines are in their idle states. And now we are modeling actual physical time progress as well as modeling this input called hundreds of milliseconds. So initially I will tick and I have not provided any input. Now I will give the start input. Now you'll notice that both automata have taken their transitions and now we have two things, sleep T, which means that the reactive system will wait until 300 milliseconds have elapsed in the environment. And to model the progression of time in the environment, we model delta T. So I will say 100 milliseconds have elapsed. I will also set hundreds of milliseconds to true, right? So now what I will do is I will take this transition because hundreds of milliseconds has gone through and I will increment the count every time hundreds of milliseconds has happened. And when count exceeds three, then I will uh, essentially go to the timeout state here. And likewise, if the real value clock exceeds 300, then I will take this transition. Let's see what happens. So I've taken uh, first hundreds of milliseconds, then the second one, and now, I'll take the third one. Now you see that T is, the continuous variable has become 300. However, this transition did not trigger because you first need to increment count here. And that 
triggers and then only in the next tick, this will trigger. And now you notice the difference that this is, has a value of 400 and this has a value of 300. That's one problem. The second problem is the other scenario where I will again start the simulation where basically we will again start with uh, uh, the start signal to true. Both will take this transition. Then I will give hundreds of millisecond and delta T to hundred. And I will do this couple of times like before. So 200 milliseconds have elapsed. Now, next time I will give a fractional time, say 55 um, milliseconds and um, I will say done to true and I will say hundred, uh, hundreds of milliseconds to false because the next HMS hasn't elapsed. So what will happen is that done triggers because of which the actual time that has elapsed is 255. However, this only gives in discrete counts. So because of discrete counting, this still shows 200. That means incorrect count. People will say, oh, this can be fixed by increasing the resolution. But then we are mixing implementation and specification, which is not a good idea. So here on, on the second uh, diagram, we have used timed SC charts instead of SC charts to model a real-time system. Now with that, I will conclude my part of the presentation and I will hand over to my colleague Nathan Allen who will continue with further presentation on modeling the pacemaker using this approach. I will stop sharing. If there are any questions or if people want a short so is tools tool is mainly for simulation or does it support any different steps of designs like code synthesis and yeah i'll talk about that a bit in my yeah in my slides <laughs> yeah it, it supports synthesis uh, both into hardware and software mm -hmm. and nathan will talk about that so oh, okay. actually the generated code can be synthesized okay. sounds great yeah so hi i'm nathan um like Path said, I'll be starting talking about the pacemaker design, the net to OSC charts that we talked about, how we can implement it on a on an embedded system, and then how we can test it, validate it, and also how we can formally verify. So to start with, I'll talk about pacemakers. So for some background, there's various different types of pacemakers, right? Um, they're usually written in the form of three or four different letters in a sequence. And so you might see like a DDI pacemaker, a VVI pacemaker, something like that. And what these mean are shown in the table there. So the first letter is where it's pacing. Is it pacing in the atria, the ventricles, or both, or, or nowhere, right? Where is it sensing? Is it sensing in the atria ventricles, both or nowhere? What method is it using? So as um, Partha may have mentioned, some of the some of the timers in the timing diagram that I'll talk about are kind of delay actions where you want to do something where you don't want to do something for a certain time. Others will be triggered actions where you want to do something after a certain amount of time, right? If, if a timer expires or something. And some will include both of those aspects. So a DDD pacemaker, which is the one that we'll be looking at here, is pacing in both the atrium and the ventricles, sensing both the atrium and the ventricles, and has kind of the full range of full gamut of, of timers um, and their actions. So this timing diagram that Partha showed before and, and kind of glossed over, I'll talk a bit more about it now. So you can see there's six main kinds of timers that we've got. Oops, bring that back there. Six main types of timers that we've got. Um, this PVARP and VRP are what we call refractory timers. So they're used to ignore events that have happened really quickly. So for uh, this might be because of, you know, picking up one signal as two separate signals, even though it was just like a, you know, with a, with a button, the example would be like debouncing or something like that. Um, or it could be crosstalk between leads or something like that, right? The ventricles are quite large. You might detect a an, an atrium event, even though it didn't actually happen. We've got two timers that deal with uh, maximum delays that should be allowed between events. So AVI is the maximum delay that's allowed between an atrial and ventricular event. Right. 
we know in the heart you've got your atria and ventricles you you know that sound when you hear on, on tv shows or whatever of like da dun da dun da dun that's the atria and then the ventricles beating right so there's some delay that we expect between the two of them aei is the opposite so it's the maximum delay between a ventricular event and its subsequent atrial event right so we can see here when an event occurs early that's great, right? We can stop the timer, we don't have to do anything. If we have this point here at number two, we didn't get a ventricular event in time of our, of our AVI timer expiring. So when the AVI timer expires, we want our pacemaker to do some action, right? It needs to pace the ventricles to cause that cardiac activity to happen. Same goes for AEI at number three here. We didn't get a natural atrial event in time, so we did an A pace, right? We paced the atria there. We've also got these two other timers, LRI and URI. URI is the maximum rate at which will allow the pacemaker to pace the heart, right? So we don't want to pace the heart really quickly. We don't want to kill the patient by pacing it too quickly. So we'll have some predetermined maximum rate that we're allowed to pace the heart. LRI is the lower rate, right? So the slowest that the heart is ever allowed to beat. Um, and as we'll see at number three here, you know, that there was no ventricular event within LRI. So similar to AEI, AVI, um, this is the time between ventricular events. If no ventricular event happens in that time, then we want to pace, right? So we can have this kind of relationship between all these timers is what we want to capture to design a pacemaker, right? So to talk about these a bit more in terms of how each timer functions, right? We want to understand how each timer functions so we can implement them in, in SC charts, their logic. So like I mentioned, the, the VRP timer, the refra ventricular refractory period timer, is a refractory period. It deals with, you know, stopping double presses, um, that kind of thing. Uh, the ventricles are large, so their signals remain high for a prolonged period of time, right? Uh, and it, and yeah, so what do we want to do? We want to start this timer on a ventricular event, right? And during the time of the timer running, we want to ignore any ventricular events that happen in that time, right? Those will be treated as double beats or whatever the case may be. Internally, pacemakers will record these um, as ventricular refractory sense signals, or commonly called VR. It's not important for the pacemaker logic. They're just kind of debugging logging statements that are, that are saved to the device for the clinician to look at later. Similarly, we have the PVARP, the postventricular atrial refractory period. Again, this starts on a ventricular event, and during that time, we want to ignore all atrial signals right, while it's running. So these will be recorded as ARs, atrial refractory sensors. Again, not used for the logic, but just used for logging for the clinician to get additional information, right? So the, the common reason for why this timer exists is because of crosstalk. Again, the ventricles are quite large. When they uh, contract, they cause massive depolarization in the heart, which can easily be picked up by the lead in the, in the atria, right? That's quite a sensitive lead. It's a lot more sensitive than the, than the ventricular lead. So we want to we want to try and avoid that somehow. So this time is used like that. AVI, like we mentioned, it's the longest allowable time between an, an atrial event and its subsequent ventricular event. Right. Um, this is used to correct instances where you lose AV conduction in your heart. Um, so you might have a blockage in your electrical conduction pathway, which means that events in the atria aren't propagating through to the ventricles. Um, so you want to pace the ventricles to correct for that. Right. So this timer here is going to start on any atrial event. If we get a ventricular event, we're good. We can we can stop the timer. We can reset it. We don't we don't need to worry about anything. If the timer expires, then we want to provide a pacing signal, right? Similarly, we have AEI atrial escape interval, which is the same but just opposite, right? So it starts on a ventricular event, uh, resets on an atrial event. This can correct uh, behaviors like like um, if we have sinoatrial node failure or something like that, where the, the atria of the heart aren't beating, the natural pacemaker of the heart is, is, has died, we want to keep some kind of rate, maybe the ventricle is operating normally, um, so we'll have this AEI timer to, to maintain that. Our lower rate interval, our LRI, uh, so this is the slowest rate at which the heart is allowed to beat, right? If we ever get this timer to expire, then we want to pace the ventricles, right? We want to pace the heart to make sure that some base level of functionality is ensured at all times, right? We don't want the heart to completely stop because then the person's going to die. So we want to start this time on a ventricular event. If we get another ventricular event, sure, that's fine. We'll just restart the timer, right? Everything's normal so far. 
Only if the pace if the timer expires do we want the pacemaker to actually pace the ventricles. And then we've got that URI, the upper rate interval. So this is the fastest that we ever want the pacemaker to pace the heart. Um, so it's an, an upper bound on the on the rate, right? Um, we never want it to pace, you know, every one millisecond or something, because obviously that's going to cause some kind of fibrillation inside the person's heart. Um, that's not going to do well for them. You'll then need some kind of, uh, you know, defibrillator to, to try and fix that, right? Not, not a pacemaker. So yeah, we don't want our pacemaker to cause fibrillation. We want it to have some maximum rate that it will pace the heart at. The way this works is usually through something that's called AVI extension. So we don't want the, generally what we want to do is extend the AVI timer if it wants to pace earlier than URI has expired. We'll talk about that a bit more when we look at the AC charts. So for URI, it's going to start on the ventricular event. If we get another ventricular event, a natural one, then we restart that timer. And its operation is to block ventricular pacing signals while the timer is running. Once it's expired, we can do whatever. But while it's running, we want to stop any ventricular signals. So how do we go about designing this in SC charts, right? So we now know how these timers work, um, the relationships between them. Our, our pacemaker is going to have two inputs, uh, an atrial sense and a ventricular sense signal. These are going to be the natural signals from the heart. And it's going to have two outputs, right? An atrial pace and ventricular pace. These are going to be the two outputs of the pacemaker that artificially cause the heart to beat in both the atrial and the ventricle. Um, each timer, we're going to capture in a region of SC charts, right? This is kind of a, each region runs in parallel. We're going to capture each of these logics in parallel, essentially. It's kind of the easiest way to, to visualize this logic. There are other ways, of course. Um, and each timer is going to have its own clock, right? They're going to have their own um, way to measure time, essentially. Uh, we're going to have our refractory signals, our refractory timers, VRP and PVRP, act as kind of barriers that the that the natural signals have to pass through in order to propagate through the rest of the system, right? If we want to block a signal during PVARP or VRP, we just won't tell the other regions, hey, there was an event, we'll just tell them nothing, right? Then they won't think that there was an event. So we can act, make them act as kind of barriers that filter the events as they come through. The things that we want to keep in mind that are a bit, you know, often trip people up when, when doing this, um, uh, we want to somehow capture that AVI extension that we'll talk about. Um, so we'll need some kind of variable to communicate between URI and AVI. And we'll also want to make sure about dependency issues. So in SC charts, we want to try and avoid kind of dependency loops. You know, if, if process A writes to variable A, process B reads from variable A and writes to variable B, and then A reads from variable B, which one would, which one would run first, right? How would you schedule them to make them all execute in a deterministic way? Um, so we want to make sure that we don't have any dependency issues in SC charts, and, and we'll talk about that a bit as well. So the ventricular refractory period timer. Um, so this is an, an SC chart of what that would look like, right? We've got our kind of visual representation down the bottom there. Um, we can see that it's in some idle state while it's waiting for a ventricular event. Once that happens, whether that ventricular event be a natural event or a, or a pacing event, we don't mind, then we have some internal signal called VE, right? This is going to be some kind of ventricular event signal that our other times use. We'll reset the clock, start the timer essentially, and then remain in this blocking state um, while that timer is running. While that timer is running, if we get another ventricular sense signal, then we'll say, hey, this is a refractory period. We could log that in, in the log file or something for the clinician to look later, but our other timers aren't going to use that data. Once our timer expires, it gets above some VRP timeout value. Then we can leave and come back to idle, and then the next ventricular event will carry on this process, right? You'll notice that we have this keyword pre in front of the ventricular pacing signals. This is to avoid that dependency issue that I talked about. Um, so if we had things reading from VE, writing to VP, and then this one is reading from VP and writing to VE, then we would have some kind of dependency issue. It wouldn't know which way to schedule the, the different automata, um, and it, it would break, right? So what we want to do is say, we're going to look at the value beforehand. We're not going to look at the current value, so don't worry about that. Pre just means look at the value from the previous synchronous tick, right? So there's going to be a one tick delay in reading this value. PVRP 
very similar, right? Again, starts of ventricular event, resets the timer. Any atrial events that happen during that time, we're going to mark as refractory signals. Once the timer expires, we can accept atrial events and, and emit them as atrial events, right? Very similar kind of timer. AVI, this is one that then we want to do something if it expires, basically, right? So we'll have some idle state again. When an atrial event comes in, we'll go to the wait state. If we get a ventricular event, everything was fine, you know? If the timer expires, so it's been longer than AVI timeout, right? Whether that be 800 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds, whatever the case may be, we want to do some action, but only if URI has finished, right? If URI is still running, then we want to, um, uh, then we still want to wait, right? We only want to leave here if we're no longer in URI, then we'll do a pacing signal, right? That's that your AVI extension that we talked about. AEI, very similar to AVI. Again, you know, on a ventricular event, you'll go here this time because it's the opposite. An atrial event, cool. We don't have to do anything. Go back to idle. Uh, if the timer expires, then we'll do a pacing signal, right? We don't have to worry about URI in any way. For AEI, URI is only involving extending AVI, right? LRI, you know, this is just making sure that there's never more than this LRI timeout between two successive ventricular events. If the timer expires, then we're going to emit a pacing event, right? Very nice and straightforward. Um, it'll also act as the kind of kickstart to our pacemaker if it has received no inputs from the environment, from the heart, um, because this time we'll start counting immediately. And once it expires, it'll start giving a VP and start the whole process going off. URI is then going to send that in URI signal um, to AVI to tell it whether or not it's allowed to pace. Um, we can see here that once it gets a ventricular event, we set in URI to true. While the time is running, that value will still be true. And then only once the timer expires do we set in URI back to false, right? So during this time, while we're in the wait location, in URI, in URI will be true, and that AVI timer won't be allowed to send a ventricular pace, right? Once the timer expires, then AVI will be told, hey, you can send a, send a pacing signal now, and if it needs to, it'll do that. So overall, like I mentioned, each of these regions are connected in parallel, right? So these are the six different regions that we talked about. We've got that internal variable in URI for communicating between AVI, which is reading in URI, and URI, which is writing to in URI, right? Um, we've got our timeout values declared as constants up here. So these are just kind of a, a base set of, of timers that would, uh, timing values that would be used for pacemakers. Um, We've got PVARP and VRP are two of the shorter ones, those refractory periods. There's generally about 300 milliseconds between an atrial event and a ventricular event, 800 between uh, ventricular and atrial. And then, you know, your URI might be 900 milliseconds. You don't want to pace faster than that. Your LRI might be 950 or something like that, right? These values can be changed by the clinician when they, when they implant the device into the person. So then what do we actually do with this, right? So we're able to simulate the model in closed loop with, this, with the heart model. Um, we have a heart model built in C, the one that Partha talked about with those cardiac cells that mimic those action potentials. Um, and these we run in a, in a heart and they we can run that in closed loop with um, our pacemaker model, right? We can generate C code from SC charts, run that with that. This is going to be simulation, right? So it's going to be fast in real time. It's going to run as fast as the computer can do it. We can have some various disease states that we want to check. Um, these are basically like test cases if you're do, doing some kind of like, you know, software verification. You know, you might say, what would the heart do if we had AV conduction block in the heart? Oh, sorry, what would the pacemaker do if we had AV conduction block in the heart? Something like that. Then we can generate the graphs, analyze them, look at the timings between events, or just visually look at the graphs to see whether we think the pacemaker did the right action or not, right? So the three, the four test cases that we'll look at here, one is just a purely normal heart, right? The heart's operating normally. We wouldn't expect the pacemaker to do anything. We've got what we call SA node failure. So this is where the, the heart no longer is beating on its own at its normal rate, um, but there is still conduction between the atria and the ventricles. We've got AV conduction blocks. So this is where the atria are beating completely normally. Everything's operating fine up there, but the there's no conduction from the atria to the ventricles, right? 
rather than getting that traditional thud thud, you'd just be getting thud, 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 right? So you can start to imagine what a pacemaker should be doing in those cases. And then we'll also look at full heart failure, which is the combination of both of those, right? We have SA node failure and AV conduction block. So to start with the normal heart, these if uh, so the blue line here is an atrial signal, right? The red line is a ventricular signal. Um, if the line goes up, then that's a sensed event, a natural event from the heart. If the line goes down, which there aren't any here because it's a normal heart, um, that's a pacing event, right? I've also labeled them all above with an AS for atrial sense, natural events, VS for ventricular sense, the natural events, and then AP and VP for the two pacing events, right? Atrial pace, ventricular pace. So here we can see the heart's behaving normally. It's got AV, AV, that thud, 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 thud that you're used to hearing at a seemingly good rate. Everything seems fine. The pacemaker's not doing anything. That's good, right? If we induce what we call SA node failure, right? So this is where that AV conduction is still ha happening fine. So things will progress from the atria to the ventricles, but the atria aren't doing anything, right? So in this case here, we need to pace the atria, right? So we're pacing the atria at our LRI rate, basically. And we are seeing that that signal naturally progresses through to the ventricles, right? There is natural conduction from A to V. We don't have to pace the ventricles. We're only pacing the atria. That's all fine, right? So this is a natural conduction from A to V. And then this is a pacing event on A here, right? So this will be A uh, expiring, which is causing an atrial pace to happen. If we have AV conduction block, so this is where the atria is behaving perfectly normally, but there's no conduction between the atria and the ventricles, the top and the bottom of the heart, right? So we can see that these atrial events are happening normally. They're the natural events, they're the positive lines, the ASs, they're all good, um, but these ventricular paces are having to be sent by the pacemaker, right? No event happened with an AVI, of this atrial sense signal. So we're having to give a pacing signal, right? Again, this all looks good, right? There's still a thud, 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 thud that you can see. It might be more close to thud, 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 thud in this diagram if you look at it, but the person's heart is still going to function. The person's not going to die, right? Um, which is what we're looking for in a pacemaker, right? We want to make sure that the person stays alive. It may not be optimal heart activity for them, but you know, some basic operation is still going to happen. And then we've got the case of full heart failure. So in this case, there's no SA um, autorhythmic behavior. So there's no atrial beating. There's no AV conduction. So anything provided to the atria won't also be reflected in the ventricles. Obviously in this case, the heart's completely dead. We'll want to pace the atria and the ventricles, right? So we can see here, it's at a much lower rate because this will be dependent on LRI of the, of the pacemaker, right? And we've got our AV, 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 AV. So this is you know, a much lower rate of the heart, but we keep that AV synchronization. The person's heart will still function. Again, maybe not 100% efficiently, but in some manner, it will still function. And that's great, right? We can see these different graphs, do these different test cases, run them, cool, get graphs, look at the results, analyze them, whatever. But that's all just simulation. What if we want to do emulation, right? We want something to run in real time and connect it to an actual virtual heart, right? or take a virtual heart and connect it to an actual real pacemaker, right? We want to test a physical device or something. This would allow us to add and remove diseases at a touch, at a touch of a button. Um, we could see the heart response in real time, you know, if we make this change, what happens to the response? Um, so we want to do this kind of emulation aspect. So for that, we need to be able to run this on an embedded platform, right? Um, so we want to be able to generate C code from SC charts. Uh, so this kind of comes to the point that you asked before. Like Partha mentioned, you can also generate hardware. You can generate Java from SC charts. But in this case, we'll be looking at C code, right? Because it's a synchronous language, uh, it uses a synchronous execution. You'll see that down here, there's a, a tick function, which does one synchronous tick. Um, you've also got a reset or initialization function to initialize that data. All of the data is stored within a, in a struct in C, right? You'll see here are our signals that we talk about. So AS and VS, AP, VP, ARVR, all those are there. We've got our internal variable in URI in the struct as well, if we wanted to use it. Um, and we'll also seed these additional two 
variables here called delta t and sleep t, right? These are how we tell SC charts what's happening in the real world in terms of time, right? It, the SC chart C code, you could run it on any platform, so they're not going to include you know, system calls or whatever to work out how long has actually happened in the physical world. You need to tell it how long has happened in the physical world. So delta t is how you tell SC charts how much time has elapsed since the last time you called the tick function. Sleep t is provided by SC charts and will tell you, the programmer, how long it is until the next clock expires, right? So if you have a timer that's about to expire in five milliseconds, it'll say five or something, right? If you want to use that logic to do kind of variable tick lengths, then you, then you can. Synchronous model of, of execution generally requires three kinds of steps each cycle. Um, you want to read your external inputs. So in our case here, this will be setting AS and VS from the heart, right? We'll also need to tell SC charts how long has elapsed. Um, we'll then want to perform our local tick, right? So we'll run that tick function in SC charts, and then we'll want to write our external outputs. In this case, we're going to do something to do with AP and VP, right? Whether that be assigning to a, an ADC or a DAC, rather, um, or we're just sending a single GPIO open high, or we're turning on some LEDs or whatever. You know, how these signals come in and how we use these outgoing signals would be up to us, right? In our case here, we're going to use a NIOS2 processor to quickly run the run the pacemaker in closed loop with the heart. Um, it should work on any microcontroller, depending on the features that you want, as long as you can get physical time, basically, um, as long as you have the peripherals that you want. So if you need to connect it to a real heart, then you want an ADC and a DAC. If you need to connect it to the virtual heart we'll talk about, then you want a UART connection, right? So. Um, NIOS2 is a system on programmable chip for Intel FPGAs. Uh, it allows you to create a processor that fits your needs exactly, right? You define which peripherals you want to include, which ones you don't care about and remove them. Um, so in our case, the three important ones would be a timer to measure the physical time, right? Some kind of UART, um, because that's how a virtual heart is working currently. Um, or if you are doing a physical device, you might want an ADC to read the signals from the heart and a DAC to write the signals to the heart, right? We're not going to talk about the ADC and DAC approach here. We're just going to look at, at UART for, communicated, for communication. Uh, do they so the have, cameras, I mean, the, 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 the NEOS to what you used for your realization, do they have cache memory? Yeah, so there's a, there's multiple different types of NEOS 2 that you can have. They have like a... Um, embedded in a performance and stuff like that. And they have varying levels of, of cache and um, various levels of branch prediction or whatever. And um, you used it? I mean, I'm just curious about how you just got rid of all this uncertainty in timing at processor level. Yeah, so the timing kind of in this slide, right? You can measure that as long as you know the time between your when you called your synchronous tick functions, um, it doesn't matter if it if it's variable, right? Um, so there's two kinds of ways that you could call your tick function. You could either do it in a fixed rate manner, where if you had an, an external timer that calls an, calls an interrupt every one millisecond or something, right? Um, then you could run your tick function every one millisecond, your delta t would be constant, right? If you want to run it inside your main loop, a while loop inside your main or something, then you'd have to use some kind of system call or count the number of CPU clock cycles or something to work out how long it's been, right? Um, that allows it to run as fast as possible, obviously, but you'd have a variable amount of time between each tick, right? So as long as the variation that you have in timing is not going to make your program take a massive amount of time, then it should be fine, right? So if you have, um, we'll do what we, uh, generally in our kinds of uh, fields would do like worst case execution time analysis. And so we might say that uh, we need the tick function for the pacemaker to run every one millisecond to guarantee its operation or something, right? If it ever takes more than one millisecond, then we'd say that's a fail, right? It's not going to operate correctly. Anything less than one is great, right? Um, that includes the, the hardware architecture, right? So you'd have to include things like cache misses, branch predictions, all those kind of overheads um, and be like, okay, in the worst case, will it take more than one millisecond? If, it, if you, the answer is yes, then you'd have to change something because you're not gonna meet your timing requirements. If your answer is no, 
it's going to be always less than one millisecond, then everything's fine, right? Even though you might have that unpredictability, that variability still, as long as you can guarantee it's always less than your, your timing requirements, then you're fine, right? Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, got it. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So then we want to interface it with the virtual heart that we have. Um, so like I mentioned, in our case, the emulator that we use for one of our courses um, uses UART to communicate with the pacemaker, right? So the virtual heart is going to send an A and a V to capture the sensed events, the natural events that come from the heart. And the pacemaker is going to send A and Vs over the UART as well to the, to the PC to send the pacing events, right? We, of course, need some kind of non-blocking UART communication, right? If you used standard file pointers in a blocking format and used read, it's going to wait until an atrial or ventricular character arrives. And if the heart is dead, then that may never arrive, right? So we, of course, need to use some kind of non-blocking UART communication. Um, but that's all very straightforward, right? Our virtual heart, you then come in, you set the, the serial port you want to use, the board rate, whatever. Um, and then communication all happens in the background. You have these, these check boxes for specifying your various diseases, and it shows the graphs on the right, similar to what we had before, right? So the atrial ones are at the top in this case, and the ventricular ones are at the bottom. This is a normal heart in this figure here, right? We don't have any diseases. The tick boxes mean that everything's working currently. A normal heart, everything's positive. Uh, sorry, I went the wrong way this way. Um, so this is a recording of what the emulator looks like, right? So we come in, select the serial port, type in the board rate, and then we can start to see under a normal situation, everything's fine, right? If we start to cause issues like AV conduction block, we'll start to see that the pacemaker is pacing. We can see these negative spikes in the ventricles, even though the atria are behaving normally. These positive spikes that come after are just a kind of artifact of when you pace the, the ventricles, they will act like a normal beat after that, right? They'll still go through their contraction and relaxation phase. Um, so you still see that behavior after, after a pacing event. We can turn off the SA behavior. So in this case, the heart's completely dead. We can see, uh, sorry, once now it's completely dead. We can see that there's pacing happening in both the atria and the ventricles, right? So this is like that, that last graph that we showed before. We can turn on AV conduction. Uh, we can turn on some of the other behaviors back um, and, and see that everything starts to behave normally again, right? So we can see that there were pacing in the atria is happening here and these ventricular events are then natural events. Once we turn on the SA node again, we can see it's now a fully functioning heart, right? So we can run through these various checkboxes, change them in real time to, to make sure that the heart's operating correctly. Like I mentioned, there's also the alternative approach. So this is uh, what Partha kind of touched on briefly before, where we might, in this case, want to test a real pacemaker, right? So this is a Medtronic pacemaker down here in the bottom left with a virtual heart, right? So we want to be able to test this, put it into different disease states, check that the physical device works properly, um, without, of course, having to do human or animal trials to check, you know, if we if the human has AV block, does the pacemaker react correctly? That's not very ethically correct, right? So whereas if we have a chip where we can just say, cut off the AV conduction, no one cares about the ethics in that case, right? We're not actually killing anyone. So we want to test a real pacemaker device with a um, virtual heart. So we need some kind of ADC and DAC, like I talked about, to, to communicate over the continuous variables that the pacemaker expects, right? On the right here, we've got our virtual heart, which is just showing what the conduction looks like. So if an LED is illuminated, that means that those cells are currently contracting. Um, so generally what you'll see is the atrial cells light up, then the ventricular, that thud-thud pattern that we're used to seeing, right? So over here, we can see this is a normal heart. You can see AV, 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 right? We can cause various disease state issues. So SA node failure without a pacemaker. We can see it's a much lower rate and emanating from here. Go back to a normal heart. You know, again, we can just change these switches. They're, all em they're, they're emulated in real time. We could have AV conduction with no pacemaker. You can see these atrial events aren't progressing through to the ventricles all the time. Sometimes they are, but not all the time. 
If we turn on the pacemaker, everything's now normal, right? We can see AV, AV. Same for SA node failure, no pacemaker emanating from here, a really low rate. Turn on the pacemaker, we now see a much more normal looking behavior, right? So not only are we able to test the pacemaker we design with a virtual heart, but we're able to test a real uh, pacemaker with, with a virtual heart, right? Just a kind of a side that, that's always interesting. So now we'll talk about how we can kind of more formally verify that our pacemaker is not going to work correctly, right? So we looked at testing, but of course, testing, you only look at a subset of, of operations, right? You, unless you can get full test coverage, then you're not going to be able to guarantee that it operates correctly. So instead, we do what we call formal verification, right? So this, uh, in our case here for timed automata, one useful tool is UPAL, uh, which is a formal verifier for timed automata. And that's how we captured our SC charts, right? We captured them as timed automata. We had those clocks. Uh, UPAL is free for academic use. Um, and there's two steps that we need to do. Draw the system in UPAL, like basically draw it as timed automata, which we basically already have, and then write the properties, right? So what do we actually want to verify? So it's very similar to what it looks like in SC charts. Um, each time will be its own automaton in, in UPAL. Um, some things are different in that they use channels rather than the word signal. Uh, reading of channels is done with a question mark. Writing to channels is done with an exclamation mark. You know, but basically the same kinds of things. Um, we can declare our timeout values. We can see our, our internal variables here. We can see the ASV, SAP, VP all up there. You know, everything very similar to what it looked like in SC charts. Our timers are going to look very similar with some slight ver uh, slight modifications. So uh, first thing that is different between SC charts and UPAL is that UPAL is non-deterministic. So if we're in this block state in SC charts up here, it'll always take this transition labeled two any time that C is greater than or equal to VRP timeout, right? Uh, it will never remain in the location block if it can leave. In UPAL, that's not an assumption that they make, right? If it can stay in that location, it may stay in that location, right? Um, and because you're formally verifying, if something may do something, then that's something you need to be worried about, right? So we need to add what we call invariance to each location as well, where we want it to leave at a certain time, right? So in this case here, you'll see that we've got an invariant on the block state of C is less than equal to VIP timeout. That means we can remain here while our clock is less than our VAP, VRP timeout. Once it's greater than or equal to, we can leave. So obviously the, the kind of overlap, the intersection of these two is when it's exactly equal to that value and it's gonna take this transition, right? Another quirk about UPAL is that you're not able to basically receive and send on a single transition. Um, so instead we use what we call committed locations. So we have kind of like this intermediary step in the middle. Uh, where we do our receives and then do our sends, right? But, you know, realistically, the logic is, is very similar between the two. For PVARP, again, very similar. We've got these committed locations to do our actions, very similar to what the uh, VRP timer looks like, right? AVI gets a bit more complicated because uh, of AVI extension. Um, once we get the uh, atrial event, URI may have already finished or URI may be still running, right? So we have that variable that we need to check for if we're still waiting for URI, then we'll come down to a waiting state. If it's already finished, then we can just continue on, right? Uh, we have both a, a flag with this in URI state and a channel so that it will immediately leave as soon as URI expires from the URI uh, automata. Um, and yeah, it just becomes a bit more complex, but you know, same kind of architecture involved. AEI, very similar to uh, what the SC charts one look like. We don't even have any committed locations. When we get a ventricular event, we come over to wait, start the timer. Once the timer reaches the timeout, we'll pace. If we got an event beforehand, we go to idle, right? Nice, very straightforward. This is the most similar one, really. LRI, also very similar. You know, if it uh, LRI times out, we pace. If we get a ventricular event, then we reset the timer. URI, also very similar again with committed locations for, for things happening in the middle. One thing that we need to do when we model as an UPAL for formal verification is that we need a plant model, right? So a plant model is just, what is the heart going to look like in this case, right? Um, because we need to know what kinds of states 
our pacemaker can be driven into by the heart, um, we want to make sure that all possibilities can be covered, right? We want it to be an over approximation, essentially. If it's an under approximation, we might not cover every single state, um, but an over approximation is what we need. So in this case, we use the random heart model, uh, which was originally designed by, by UPenn. Um, it randomly generates events between some bounds. So for the atrial event, you can see there's some A min weight and A max weight. It'll randomly decide to take, take some transitions um, and emit a sense event when that happens, right? Same for the ventricles, right? Randomly between some minimum time and maximum time, they'll emit some sensing events. If they get a pacing event, they'll reset their timers, right? So then in so this case, it says that they cannot uh, describe this, the, the, the certain disease model do, that you mentioned in the other slide, right? So this is an over approximation, right? So technically every single disease is captured in this over approximation, right? Exactly. So because, yeah, yeah, because this is random, right? If sure, if you made That's if right. you made V min weight equal to V max weight for, for both of them, then you'd only ever have kind of like one set of states that it would be checking for. Um, you just need to make sure that you know if as long as this these timers are uh, produce an over approximation and capture those disease states, then it's fine, right? So that's why a random heart is fine. You could make a perfectly accurate heart that can capture all the dynamics, um, but which would be less of an over approximation, closer to the actual level of what you want. But an over approximation is, is fine in the case of formal verification. Yeah, but it should be super conservative, right? I mean, yeah, this, this will be super conservative, right? Because it's a massively over approximation um, mm -hmm. of what the heart space, state space would be. Okay. So in, in UPAL, properties are captured as computational tree logic. Um, that's a, a type of, of logic which you can use to write formal properties. But some things can't be captured in that, um, like things like time constraints, in which case you use linear temporal logic. Um, and to do that, to, to capture those kind of properties, we're going to use monitors. Right? So monitors are essentially just if we define our properties as automata, as timed automata, uh, which are able to check their signals, right? They might check for a sequence of signals. They might check that you need an A followed by a B, a V or something, um, or they might check timing relationships, right? They may, may, must never be longer than 300 milliseconds between an A and a V event, something like that. Um, we'll then have a violation location in these monitors, which if we reach that state, that's bad, right? One property that's pretty standard in UPAL anytime you want to verify something is about deadlock. So you'd have this thing which says AG not deadlock. This basically means that it's it's always true that you're not deadlocking, right? So this starting point here just means always true, essentially, right? So always true, not deadlock, right? I'll run through some monitors, just three of them. Um, so URI, for example, we might want to check that uh, no VP, so no pacing signal is emitted before URI expires, right? And a ventricular event will reset the timer, right? So we might capture this. We get a ventricular event, start the timer. If we get a VP and it's less than URI timeout, then that's a violation. If we got a VP and it was greater than or equal to URI timeout, that's okay, right? And then we reset the timer. So our property for that would just be true. That's always true that we're never in this violation state for the URI monitor, right? Similarly, for AVI, we might want to check that a ventricular event occurs before AVI expires. We'll also need to check for AVI extension, right? Um, and we might want, in this case, just say it's always true that we never reach this violation state again, right? Our CTR properties become very simple when we're doing monitors. PVARP, we might also want to check that we never create an uh, atrial event signal when we're within our PVARP window, right? We want to check that our PVARP is working correctly. We can write a monitor for that. And then we can just come through to the Verify tab in UPAL and click Check next to all of them, and they pop up with green dots. They all passed. Yay, right? So our pacemaker is able to meet all of our criteria. So from there, I'll then pass over to Hammond, who will talk about security aspects. Thank you, Nathan. Does anyone have any questions for Nathan before I begin? No, go ahead. Cool. cool, thank you. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slide. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the security side of things as 
uh, in this application that Partha and Nathan have introduced. Um, I'm sorry if I um, stumble a little bit of my words. I've been up for a while. It's now 4 a.m. local time, but I will do my best. Okay, so how are we doing? Um, so why are we even talking about cybersecurity? Well, uh, Nathan and Partha have done a really good job of outlining the kind of core functionality of the pacemaker and other implantable medical devices. But actually, the trend in industry is, despite the fact that we can represent the functionality of these devices and come up with these clever rules and you know implement their system in a synchronous manner and all this kind of things, at the end of the day, there's a lot of functionality that's going to be implemented beyond and on top of those core routines. Uh, and those functionalities often will consist of new smart functionalities or customizable functionalities and often will include more connectivity for those devices um, and in pacemakers and other impl implantable medical devices we're increasingly seeing both wireless and internet enabled features where for instance your pacemaker may talk to your doctor may talk to your insurance company um, and may talk to even your smartphone to report various information about it so what does that mean well, as we consider the more complex uh, systems that are being implemented now, we need to consider the kind of full life cycle of any of these products and the different intersections that those um, parts have with regards to the cybersecurity of those systems. So the CPS as described is made up of a plant and you know that plant can be the uh, considered the heart or the heart model or the testing environment for that heart, but could also be other things as well, could be connected um, hardware, it could be the charging and discharging system for the pacemaker. It's a, it's basically the, the plant and the interconnections with that plant. The hardware is the computational resources that your system is running upon, um, i.e., you know, what is the actual maybe processor that's inside the pacemaker um, and things like the battery and so on and so forth. And then there's also the software, which is what we've talked a lot about today so far with regards to the synchronous implementation of software and things like that. But every single one of those components has a life cycle where they need to be designed and implemented, uh, tested and deployed and maintained. And we've talked a little bit about each of these. But essentially what you end up with is a big intersection of all of these different components and their independent life cycles. And if any one of those areas has a vulnerability in it or can be compromised in some way, you may be able to compromise the functionality of the overall system itself. So if we consider the pacemaker, we could, for instance, say, modify the pacemaker so that there is deficient leads. Um, and then eventually those leads will fail. And so as a result, we've compromised the hardware in some way. Or we might find a way to compromise the software, for instance, with an update that's over the air after the pacemaker has been installed. So that could be in the maintenance part of the of the product's life cycle. Um, or initially during the design stage, we might specify constraints that are faulty uh, after a designer has told us what the real ones need to be so that the product is kind of doomed to fail from the get go. So a lot of these different um, vulnerable areas can be caught, especially by formal verification, which is why it's such a powerful technique. But other issues, especially during the maintenance part of the life cycle, those need to be caught in an ongoing uh, or in other ways, which we'll talk a little bit more about now. So what are the unintended consequences? Well, Unfortunately, with this in increasing interconnectivity, um, it's already known that medical devices have been compromised. Um, there have been uh, 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 things published in the literature showing that pacemakers can be reprogrammed to give deadly shocks, um, pumps that have been reprogrammed to deliver the incorrect insulin levels, which can cause um, uh, sickness and in some cases even deaths as well, um, denial of services attacks on um, implantable cardiac pacemakers so they stop working properly, um, and Bill Meisel, the former chairman of the FDA, actually um, spoke once saying that um, he personally was aware or the FDA was aware of hundreds of medical devices that had been infected by malware. So this is a known issue at this point, um, to the point that the former vice president, Dick Shaney, actually had the wireless capabilities of his internal pacemaker disabled completely as they were worried that it might be a viable attack mechanism on him. So clearly this is a, a known issue. So why, uh, why, do we, why is it so difficult? Well, 
while there are traditional security mechanisms that one can rely on, you know, I have a laptop, I can turn the wireless on my laptop on, I can be reasonably confident that it's going to stay to some level of safety. The problem with pacemakers and, and other, you know, restricted embedded cyber physical systems, especially those in the medical domain, is that um, traditional security mechanisms that we might use in a thing like a laptop might not be suitable for that particular application domain. And there's a number of things that complicate this. So firstly, uh, in the case of a pacemaker, it's a low power device that needs to last quite a long time, um, that needs to have a certain level of, 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 of you know, internal battery, basically. Um, there was a really clever attack where a proof of concept was, was performed on a pacemaker, actually, where the pacemaker designer had said, okay, we need to we need to use you know, state-of-the-art encryption and, to, and access control to make sure that our pacemaker can't be compromised. Uh, and what the attackers actually did was they didn't bother trying to break the encryption. Instead, they just sent a whole load of request packets to the encryption libraries, which then are quite computationally difficult. And it would actually drain the battery of the pacemaker, even though they weren't sending it any commands because they were sending it ongoing encryption and de-encryption requests the pacemaker would uh, just drain its own battery, just trying to keep up with all of the, the requests that were coming in. So, you know, the, the, the classic kind of, you know, oh, we'll just put access control on it often can't work, um, especially when you also consider emergency care. So if you have an ambulance, um, they need to, to take some kind of corrective action to you at short notice, like using a defibrillator. Typically one would want to inform the pacemaker of the patient that you're going to be using a defibrillator that can be done using wireless, special wireless things, but now they need to be able to also communicate with your pacemaker to, to essentially inform them that a defibrillator is going to be used. So how do they get the encryption keys? And so you end up with a, a, a big um, quandary where the normal rules for, for how you govern access controls become quite tricky. Um, further complicating things, even if you do come up with a system that's perfect and you implement it, if eventually it has a bug in it, software updates on, on embedded medical devices are complex due to the regulatory framework surrounding those devices where every single thing about them needs to be certified by an agency such as the FDA. Um, and so it might mean that if you want to deploy a patch, that patch has to first go through the FDA, which is an extremely time consuming and expensive process. Um, so essentially, um, it becomes quite tricky to try and secure all attack vectors in a, a, a reasonable and time, you know, a, a reasonable engineering manner. So what can we do? So there's two general approaches. So the first one still focus on access control. Um, so they still, of course, have the potential to be bypassed. Um, you know, you can do things where you do interesting encryption based on uh, the, the speed of heartbeats or making sure that you're within, you know, touching distance of the patient and, and things like that. So that at least there is some level of physical security, if, if you will. But of course, all of those things still have the potential to be bypassed with a, you know, a, a, a variety of different threat models. Um, alternatively, what we might do is focus on something like runtime monitoring, where we say, okay, well, at least uh, if something bad happens, we might be able to detect that it's happening. So maybe we could wear like an external monitor. You could consider a smartwatch application, which is paying attention to your pacemaker or your smartphone. And it, it, it notices if the pacemaker starts doing something strange and says, hey, your pacemaker is doing something strange. Maybe you should do something about that. But unfortunately, that external monitoring, while it might be able to detect that, it's not going to be able to take any corrective action. It's external. It doesn't have any control over the pacemaker. Um, so, so those kinds of approaches also have weaknesses. So our proposal is to instead say, okay, well, we've got our policies. Perhaps there is a way that we can perform corrective actions over our uh, device so that no matter, even if the system is attacked, it will at least obey a certain minimum quality of service. And that minimum quality of service uh, basically defines, you know, the life or death kind of properties for a patient. So, okay, maybe it can't, uh, maybe it can't stop you from degrading the performance of the pacemaker, but it shouldn't be able to command the pacemaker to take those kinds of actions that would immediately cause life-threatening injuries for the patient. So how do we do this? We do this with a technique called runtime enforcement, 
where we bound a special um, discrete hardware module with the control system for the pacemaker to enforce some set of critical properties. Um, and for this particular piece of research that was done, we wanted to overcome two existing limitations with work, the, the, the state of the art with enforcers. Um, so the first one considered that existing runtime enforcements uh, algorithms are actually almost always implemented in software or a runtime. So actually one of the, the classic runtime enforcers is, is like a software firewall on your computer. It's paying attention to incoming connections going in and out of your uh, device. And if one violates some access control policy, that connection will be terminated. It takes a, a corrective action. But that's informal enforcement, whereas we're going to be looking at formal runtime enforcement. Um, the other issue, of course, is that an enforcer itself may be vulnerable, depending on how it's implemented. So we're going to take a look at that as well. So I'm just going to re-remind you of these properties. Now, Nathan and Partha both intro uh, introduced them with those timing diagrams of the heart. Here, I'm going to express those policies in words. Um, so for instance, we can say that the, the atrial and the ventricle pulses can't happen simultaneously. Um, that's quite obvious. Otherwise, we'd be pacing both chambers of the heart at the same time. It would be a major medical problem. Um, Nathan mentioned there's a couple of timers, about four timers, which um, talk about <clears throat> the, the, the timings between pulses as well, where we can express these rules. So the, the, va the ventricle um, sense or pulse must be true within some AVI cycles after an atrial event, um, or the atrial event must be true within some number of cycles after a ventricular event. Um, and then likewise, we have uh, an, an upper and lower bound on um, the speed of the ventricular event as well. So <clears throat> those uh, policies come from the medical field and they basically define the minimum quality of service that a pacemaker should have for a given patient. And any customization of the values of the actual timing should be within those bounds. So now we can say, okay, well, we've got some rules that the pacemaker is not allowed to diverge from, but the pacemaker controller can make some intelligent decisions about how it behaves within the scope of those rules. Now, if we have a software enforcement algorithm, which tries to protect, you know, the bound, the values of these timers, <clears throat> what prevents the pacemaker from going outside of them if the software is compromised in some way, for instance, via a wireless connection? What can we do? The concept with runtime enforcement is to say, well, we have some additional piece of hardware, almost like a backup controller, which will sit between the plant and the control system and the cyber physical system in the middle in like a, a closed loop sort of environment. The enforcer will both capture incoming inputs, making their way to the control system and outputs from the control system back to the plant. And it's capable of performing edits to those inputs and those outputs to ensure that those values remain safe. So let's have a look at that. Um, so how do we actually express the rules? So firstly, we need to say, uh, come up with the language that we use for this. For this, we're gonna use discrete timed automata, which is a policy specification language. Um, here, it's essentially very similar to the one that um, Nathan showed you earlier. It's discrete timed though, rather than dense. And um, we use integer clocks and integer variables where essentially the clocks count in synchronous ticks. So there's an example of a property on the screen there in front of you. So we have some property. It says A and B cannot happen simultaneously. A and B should alternate starting with A and B should be true within five ticks after A occurs. So if we have a look at this diagram, uh, consider the first comma to be is that the, the first two values zero zero the first one is a the second one is b and we can see okay after a one zero occurs we go from state l zero to state l one uh, then we start some timer v1 we can stay in that state while v1 is less than five and if we ever get a zero one which is uh, the B is true and A is not true, we can return back to the safe state L0. However, if the timer elapses, it gets to the greater than or equal or five case and A has not become true, then we should go to some violation state L2. Alternatively, if at any time A and B happen at the same time, we should go to that violation state as well. <clears throat> so that's how we'll express these properties as these little automatas. We have a couple of rules about how we come up with the automata as well. So firstly, they must be deterministic, i.e. for any given location, 
there must not be two valid transitions out of that location for some input. So the conjunction of guards must be unsatisfiable. <clears throat> Likewise, the automata should be complete. That means that there should not be a situation where we have an input where we can't go somewhere. So there shouldn't be any input that could go to locations and there shouldn't be any input that can't go to any location whatsoever. It needs to be both deterministic and complete. <clears throat> so this is how we actually uh, encode that enforcer internally. We're going to split it up into two separate enforcers, the input enforcer and the output enforcer. And these operate iteratively. Firstly, the inputs will come in from the plant. The input enforcer will decide if those inputs need to be transformed in any way before being passed on to the control system. <clears throat> then after the control system has emitted its outputs, these will go to the output enforcer, which will combine those with the transformed inputs to make any decisions about the outputs which are making their way back to the heart. And after that, they will then advance the internal state of the enforcer itself. So for instance, advancing things like timers. <clears throat> One thing that's also worth noting is that an enforcer shouldn't make any edits if it doesn't need to. So why am I bringing that up? Well, we could say that in this uh, first case here, A and B cannot happen simultaneously. A and B alternate starting with A. You can see there's a self loop on L0, which just says no inputs. <clears throat> it is true to say then, therefore, that if we never received an A or a B, we could just stay in that safe state forever. But obviously, that's going to disable some functionality of our system. Uh, that's not ideal if we just stay in L0 forever. <clears throat> it means that our machine is kind of frozen, if you will. So ideally, <clears throat> pardon me, I've got a bit of a cough for some reason. Pardon me, the um, enforcer should only take edit actions when necessary. It should never make an edit action unnecessarily. We call this property transparency. So here's an example of a, an attack, which the enforcer policy is going to deal with. <clears throat> so let's assume that the URI cycles here is the value three. And here's our policy P4. After a ventricular event, another ventricular event may only happen after some URI cycles. So this sets the upper rate interval or the shortest possible time between two events. <clears throat> so at time T0 there, the heart pulses. <clears throat> Sorry, there's a sense. <clears throat> and um, the... Uh, there's a uh, transformed sense that comes out of the enforcer as well. And then after four cycles, the ventricular pulse, that's the, the second part of the heartbeat, goes off as well. Now, let's assume that the attacker takes control of the pacemaker at the time equals five cycle, and then says, okay, I'm gonna emit another ventricular pulse from the controller immediately. This would violate our enforcer property policy P4, <clears throat> because if there was that VP present, the policy would advance to that forbidden L2 state, the violation state. So rather than allowing that to occur, the enforcer notes that this would be a violation, and in that time T6 there, instead edits it out. <clears throat> this prevents that uh, pulse coming through and propagating its way into the heart. So that control signal coming out of the pacemaker would be mitigated and removed before it harmed the patient. <clears throat> Maybe it's a too fundamental question, but is it plausible that the imposter itself can be a victim of attack? Yes, not so much in the pacemaker case because the uh, heart is a relatively trustworthy instrument. <clears throat> but you could consider, for instance, <clears throat> the scenario where you have, say, a, um, a uh, insulin pump where the inputs are coming from externally from the buttons, which are being told to, to instrument some kind of value, you know, dis dispense this much insulin. It's possible that a malicious user could queue up too much insulin to be deposited, right? A medically unsafe value. So that could be a scenario where an input enforcer just stopped that input even being able to be propagated into the control system. <clears throat> even if your control system could handle it, that input is invalid, essentially. So you should just remove it. 
So how do we actually define the edits? So here I just said that we, we have some input, uh, some output coming out of the controller that we don't like. And so we get rid of it. <clears throat> we need a formal way of doing that. The way that we do that formally is we specify some edit functions, an input edit function and an output edit function. Formally, these are a set of possible values that are not going to be violating. <clears throat> In the case of these edits here, the only possible non, uh, the only possible value that would not be a violation would be to set it to zero or to, to remove it. And so that's going to be a set of only one value, but it is possible that there would be more than one value that didn't violate. How do we choose between those values in the set? We can either do a random choice where we just randomly pick one that's satisfying, or we could do a minimum distance where we just pick the closest possible value. Uh, and there's also other types of edit functions. Uh, one where, for instance, it's manually specified at design time, which we call the selected edit. But in this case, we can just use the random edit because there is only one possible value. So we're always going to pick the right one anyway. Now, if we consider that the runtime enforcer actually has the power to edit any of its signals, uh, we really need to ensure that the runtime enforcer itself is both trustworthy uh, and can't be compromised by an attacker, because otherwise we could end up with a scenario where the enforcer is compromised and the controller is not compromised. <clears throat> this is why we choose to target our enforcer directly to hardware. By basing the operation rules of the enforcer on the medical rules, the minimum quality of service that's required to keep the patient safe. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> I'm terribly sorry about this cough. It's very distracting. <clears throat> the like software. Or... Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. It's okay. The software of the um, system can be altered or updated, <clears throat> but hardware can be built to be permanent. And it's okay to make, in this case, the hardware permanent because it's based on the it's based on the <clears throat> rules from the medical system, talking about the 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 minimum quality of service for the patients, and those don't change. They are based on external properties. The controller itself will tailor systems to be exactly what the patient needs within these minimum quality of service, but the minimum quality of service should be enough that the patient won't have harm if the system falls to them. <clears throat> Whereas software is intrinsically difficult to analyze and, you know, let's say we have an entire uh, complicated application running with some runtime, with some RTOS, maybe it can take over the air updates. <clears throat> now we need to have more complex verification schemes. <clears throat> Hardware, however, we can more easily check that for timing and functional properties because we'll only need to analyze the enforcer hardware module to ensure that it can ver it, that it can guarantee these minimum quality of service. <clears throat> so here's an enforcement algorithm. This is the one that was used for this particular research. And we can talk about... <clears throat> Pardon me. I think the air is a bit cold where I'm... <clears throat> we can talk about um, how within each of these steps, we can see that iterative behavior of the enforcer. And we can also see how the, um, we can also see how we can convert that into some equivalent hardware circuit. So let's talk through it. So in the initial state, we set some timers to zero and we set the state of the system to the initial state. Then we start an infinite loop. We first read in the input channel we run the input enforcer, which is defined by the lines five through nine. <clears throat> and this is essentially just saying, check put, make sure that it is going to advance the system to an accepting state. If it doesn't advance it to the accepting state, take some replacement value instead. And here we define the replacement value as some random edit, but as I said, there's usually only going to be one possible correct value. Once we've done that, we release the input to the control system. We then read the outputs from the control system and perform the same thing, but on the output side. <clears throat> Once we've released the outputs to the system, we then update the internal state of the enforcer. <clears throat> this is the circuit diagram that that will eventually simplify to. We have some out inputs coming from the plant on the left. They go through some multiplexer before being released to the control system. 
<clears throat> that multiplexer is going to make its decision based on the value of the inputs, value based on the value of the state and the clocks from the enforcer system itself. And then the controller will also see that uh, kind of behavior when it releases its outputs through the same kind of output editing MUX. That MUX will make decisions based on the values of the inputs, the outputs, and the state and clock registers. And then within each clock tick, we update to produce the next value of the state and the clocks. <clears throat> Our constraint here that we want to say is no matter what, the next state that we update to cannot be in the violation state or any, any one of the violation states. <clears throat> So how do we ensure that? What we want to do is functionally verify our hardware to ensure that there is no possible scenario where we end up in a violation state. And we can do that using eBMC, which is a model checker for hardware designs. It functions over assertions in Verilog code. So what we will do is we will take our policies, we will use this algorithm to generate hardware, <laughs> and then using eBMC, we will say, ensure that there is no possible scenario where the next state can be the violation state. And using k induction with k equals one, because that red box is a purely combinational function, it's actually quite quick to do that analysis. <clears throat> <clears throat> Further, we don't want to in introduce major overheads to our system because this is, a, as I said, a very resource constrained environment. So we want to ensure that the critical path of the system and the max frequency of the system is, is acceptable. Uh, there will be two registers for signals to propagate through, so the overhead is going to be the frequency of the clock times two. <clears throat> and we can use quarters power play to also determine what uh, some kind of estimate of the power consumption of the system will be with some parameters that we choose there that are based on some reasonable numbers. <clears throat> um, this does assume that the system that is implemented on a FPGA or CPLD, which is a little bit unreasonable, but <clears throat> and still give us an idea of how it would be if you implemented it in an ASIC. It gives you some ballpark figures. <coughs> What's really nice is the um, hardware risk assessment tells us that the failure rate of the system is not going to be the failure rate of the enforcer times the failure rate of the pacemaker, because the enforcer is going to be encapsulating the original controller and is actually capable of taking over the pacemaker's um, system. Um, However, because the enforcer is omnipotent and has the ability to edit signals itself, the failure rate of the system basically just becomes the failure rate of the enforcer, i.e. if the enforcer fails, the entire system is going to fail. So if we make the enforcer very well, if we guarantee that the enforcer works, we can actually end up with a pacemaker, which we think would be much more reliable. In terms of our attack models, um, if the attacker switches off the pacing, policies P2, P3, and P5 will ensure that between them, the pacemaker continues to pace. If the attacker pacemaker uh, attacker reprograms the pacemaker to pace too quickly, policy P4 will also catch that and prevent that from happening. And if the attacker reprograms the pacemaker to pace AP and BP simultaneously, um, policy P1 would catch that. And then what we can do is use eBMC to validate that all possible attack traces and that we've just described are mitigated to ensure that there is some minimum safe quality of service. <clears throat> so this is how you can do it. You can provide all of those policies in the language that we specified. Um, then we can convert those policies using our compilation algorithm to synthesize uh, to, to convert them to Verilog. Then you can synthesize Verilog um, into hardware, and then you can take eBMC and verify that those, that hardware is indeed correct. Once you've got the hardware, you can also do things like calculate the overhead using the timing tool, Cordis TimeQuest, and the power tool using Cordis PowerPlay. So what do we get? If you do the policies individually, they're tiny. <clears throat> so for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, just P1 on its own only has two states and no timers. I don't, it makes eight logic elements, so it's absolutely minuscule. Um, if you do all of the policies together, um, there's two different ways you combine them. You can either do it sequentially or take the um, uh, conjunction of them, uh, sorry, the product of them. Um, either way, it's still gonna be quite small. Um, the largest one there, P1 uh, product of P2, product P3, product P4, product P5, that has uh, still only 761 logic elements. So it's still not particularly large. Um, 
And if you uh, come up with the optimal way of representing that, so that P1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that is a handmade representation which of the policies which um, combines all of the rules together into a single more efficient state machine. If we consider the verification design of the system and the overhead and the dynamic power consumption, you can see some of the numbers there. Um, even in the most complicated case where we had the 761 logic elements, still in 12 seconds of verification time, because as I said, we we're only verifying a combinational circuit, which makes it a much more straightforward proposition. Um, unfortunately, the 761 logic elements don't fit on the FPGA that we were analyzing for. So those two numbers in the bottom right are missing there. But you can kind of see that from the P12345 <clears throat> um, property there, that the overhead is around 206 nanoseconds in the worst case, which is you know totally acceptable. Um, and the dynamic power consumption there is about 0.07 milliwatts at uh, operating at 100 kilohertz which is more than enough speed for the pacemaker io <clears throat> the more hardware you have the more uh, verification time you need but even then those numbers are still quite small and there's an order of magnitude smaller overheads if you consider these compared to software based enforcers so i'm just going to quickly touch on some conclusions now and then i'll uh, hand back over to nathan and partha for their concluding remarks as well um, so I want to just cover the the, the kind of uh, general overview here. So hopefully from the talk that we've just done, you've heard that biomedical cyber physical systems are highly safety critical systems. That's the main emphasis point. And here, what we mean by safety critical is that the failure of these systems can have serious side effects. So to resolve that, we first want to consider how we can do formal design paradigms to reduce the design errors of the systems by using things like SC charts, and then we want to look at how we can do static verification to reduce any design time errors that we might have accidentally added to our design and runtime enforcement to try and reduce those runtime errors. However, even when a system has been designed with the best intentions, it's possible that a malicious adversary at some part of the product's life cycle may be able to introduce a defect which would have an impact on the safety of that system. <clears throat> how can we resolve that when perfect security defenses are infeasible? Well, if we do hardware-based security, it has a much reduced attack surface. It's still not perfect. Uh, attacks like supply chain attacks can still compromise hardware-based systems, <clears throat> but it is greatly reduced compared to a software attack surface. So ideally, a system which is based on hardware runtime enforcement can mitigate those kinds of software-based attacks, which are so critical in this place. Um, so I'll, I'll now hand back to um, Nathan and Partha for their concluding remarks as well. Can I ask a short question before that? So, yes, of course. So, yeah, so uh, as you mentioned on the other slide, it, I mean, I didn't get every tiny little detail, but it looks to me, as you mentioned, the impulse itself looks like a small controller. Yes. So then with some risk of too much of generalization, can I say that maybe implementing something in hardware is more secure than software realization? Is it, a, it, is it, it really a... depends on so not all control systems will be able to implement it in a be able to be implemented in a reasonable way in hardware mm -hmm. um that's the the main barrier that stops us just implementing everything in hardware is that it might become unreasonable to say you know my i, I need all these crazy algorithms which are for in the case of a pacemaker maybe they're doing some imu stuff they're taking in the motion of the patient they're taking in how much activity the patient's doing they've got some dynamic equations to try and model the best way you know the, the the most appropriate pacing rate that kind of system may be too complex to realize in hardware in any reasonable way which is why we use a computer process or you know a microprocessor instead mm -hmm. um in general the answer to your question though is yes it, it is more reasonable to say that a pure hardware system has a reduced attack space than a hardware software system just by the virtue of the fact that it is only hardware it might not be able to be updated and so on and so forth so the major barrier of having this hardware fully hardware based controller is the complexity of the control algorithm right? yes 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 yeah yeah uh -huh. you you can't reasonably put everything into hardware so what our suggestion here is um, is to just put the minimum quality of service policies into hardware and then let your more complex control systems work within the bounds of the, the of the you know safety barrier basically got it got it thank you thank you for the question
So um, uh, thanks, Aman. Um, I have just put in chat uh, a paper about your question regarding the design of uh, systems which are more data oriented. Uh, this survey paper uh, looks at how do we, uh, what are the challenges of designing data driven and model based uh, uh, systems? Mm -hmm. So, indeed, I think your question is very interesting. Um, basically, um, just reflecting on your question, um, I would like to make a few concluding remarks. The first one is non determinism is not always bad. And, and that's what you are pointing out because non determinism is good when you are specifying, but non determinism in the implementation is not good. And in the synchronous approach, the idea is that if the specification is non deterministic or non reactive, it can be rejected at compile time using constructiveness analysis, similar to the concept of constructive circuits. So if the program is constructive, then we can always have a static scheduling order such that we can always generate deterministic code. So that's the idea. Um, but there are many challenges and uh, that obviously limits the design space, uh, like you said. Um, so that's one challenge. The other challenge is how do we generate distributed code, parallel code from sequential, uh, sorry, synchronous specifications. What we have presented in our approach, what Nathan presented is a single tick function. But what if we have a multi-core processor or mini-core architecture on which we generate code? There are obvious, uh, implications, especially because we can react to both the presence and absence of events. So detecting absence in a distributed setting can be quite challenging. Uh, so there are synchronous languages compilers to deal with this, but that, that is indeed one, one potential uh, area that we need to look at. Now, the final point I would like to make about kind of future work is, how do we combine data-driven and model-driven designs in the future? And in this space, we are starting to look at, can we use actually neural network architectures to design safety critical systems such as the pacemakers? And we, we, have just, we are just scratching the surface in, in this. And one of my PhD students, uh, Moon Kim, is currently looking at this problem. But, um, yeah, it's not as simple as what we have presented in the tutorial. Got it. Thank you. What was that, Arthur? Would you like to add anything to what I said? No, I think, you know, mo most of my conclusions were summed up. <laughs> thank you. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the great tutorial. So I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. So it was really interesting. So, I mean, so I, uh, once I worked on this uh, kind of work and that on this medical domain, I also worked on this real-time analysis and worst case response time analysis and all this formal verification. But what I realized when I, back in South Korea, I worked uh, with some people from industry and what I realized at that time and by which I was a little bit frustrated was that they actually don't care about this complicated thing. So for them, I mean, that what they would, I mean, they would tell me was like, I mean, I don't need this complicated, scary mathematics. And I just need, I just want to build a small camera that can look inside your ear. And it does not, I mean, harm your, I mean, even if I miss some of the, you know, time timing requirements. So that's what they would say, but... Mm -hmm. So that was the main barrier for me. I mean, so I always like to, I mean, sell this kind of co correct by construction scheme. By doing this, you can be free of this kind of thing. And we had a discussion about this in your test cases. You know, so we talked about this conservativeness and they, they do, actually they didn't care. I mean, even if they do some, I mean, provide some guarantee and they don't care, they were more, 
interested by typical cases and they don't care about this super rare, you know, non-representative extreme cases. That was my experience. But what why I was impressed by your work is that you guys take a serious mathematics and serious theory and you guys make a good bridge between the practice and the theory. And that is the uh, the most impressive part to me. So thank you for the great work. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well. Thank you Thanks for those comments. Thank you. Yeah. No. But I, I also agree with you. Uh, we have similar experience when working oh. with the industry. And, yeah. and I think bridging that gap is a, is a crucial thing. I would just like to make a few observations uh, before we conclude. Nathan uh, has an open source compiler from Hybrid Automata to C. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, called uh, the, the modeling language for hybrid. We didn't present in detail, but the modeling language for hybrid automata is called HAML, H A M L. And uh, Nathan, can you put it in chat as well? If you have uh, it handy. Sure. Yeah. And um, for the uh, enforcement and the hardware security work, uh, there is uh, easy RTE. Uh, which is a tool that was written by Amal. So, mm -hmm. so go, both are public domain tools. So, oh. uh, and, and also uh, Hamel can be used for any kind of cyber physical application, not biomedical, because you can model any kind of cyber physical application uh, mm -hmm. where you can express uh, the plant model as a composition of um, hybrid automata, tagged automata. Oh. Oh. Right. Is this prep based on the work from the Stephen Edward? I mean, he was also working on this tool, right? And yes, uh, we, we um, well, uh, yeah, um, actually, Edward Lee and Stephen Edward, they, they invented the name Pret. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, we, we use it in our. Oh. Um, yeah. I was just thinking if it, this is an extension of that tool, but you just. Yeah. Think, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So our, we, our we use their threat architectures. We, yeah, we have one paper where where we use their threat machine to oh. design pacemakers. Uh, Nathan uh, and Hammond and myself, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we have an ISOC paper mm -hmm. in 2017 where we use their threat architecture. Is that correct? PTM. We use PTM. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you again for the great work. Oh, thank you very okay. much. Thanks for attending. And uh, especially my thanks to Hammond for, uh, I really uh, would like to appreciate. And you, you seem to be coughing quite a lot in this.